African continent. So this is very exciting. And um, it's the second of our series of uh, uh, employment law issues um, in the African continent. And I am joined by colleagues of mine from our offices throughout Africa who will unpack uh, the intricacies of uh, enforcing restraints of trade in the African um, continent. Um, Today, it's going to be a short, sharp discussion, and we are holding everyone to the one hour requirement. Uh, and I'm going to start with some quick fire questions. And these are designed to put my colleagues on the spot. There's going to be yes and no answers, no ifs, buts, maybes. And um, hopefully, we'll then unpack in a little bit more detail um, the um, complexities of enforcing restraints in the in, in the various jurisdictions. So um, we're going to start today, I think, first of all, with my colleague from uh, Ghana, Patricia Mamouni. Patricia, hello. Hi, everyone. Patricia, Hi. restraints of trade, can, are they enforceable in Ghana? Yes, they are. Excellent. And then moving to Jimmy Samuri from Kenya. Jimmy, are you here? Yes, I am here, Brian. Right. Restraints of trade, yes or no? Enforceable yes. or not? Yes. Yes, yes. excellent. Chevron Darby from Mauritius. Hello, Chevron. Hi, Brian. How are you today, Chevron? Good, thank you. Yourself? Right. Well, um, what's the story in Mauritius? Because that's Francophone and... Um, uh, common law, um, enforceable or not? In enforceable. Okay. I suspect we're going to hear the ifs and buts shortly. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Fisser from beautiful Namibia. Um, Charles? Hi, Brian. Yes, indeed. They are. Enforce enforceable. Indeed. Excellent. Eustache Ngaga from uh, Rwanda. Hello, everyone. Yeah, they are enforceable in Rwanda. Excellent. Excellent. This is all good news today. Um, and um, Ross Alcock from South Africa. Um, hi, Ross. Hi, Brian. Yep. Restraint of trades are enforceable in South Africa. Okay. And Patrick uh, Perinari from Uganda. What's the position in sunny Uganda? Uh, hi, Brian. Restraint of trade is uh, enforceable in Uganda. Okay, so um, thanks to all my colleagues for the um, for their clear answers to to those questions. Um, let's just have a quick look at uh, um, some other quick fire questions. Ross Alcock, South Africa, tell us the courts that you would enforce them in, um, and um, how quick. Can you achieve a result from client in South Africa? Ryan, so uh, restraints of trade can be enforced in the, the high court uh, as well as in the labor court uh, if it stems from a contract of employment. So if a restraint is in a contract of employment, you can enforce it in the labor court as well. Um, you can enforce it on an urgent basis. Uh, restraints of trade are inherently urgent. Uh, so that means that you would could tell the normal time periods with, within which to bring an application. So uh, assume, Ross, for purpose of this discussion, that we have the best possible facts. How quickly can we get an interim injunction or interdict in South Africa? Uh, it can be brought on an urgent basis, which would be in a, a day or two, or, or sometimes we bring them on a, what we call a semi-urgent basis, which is just so we've got uh, more, inf more information uh, and we bring more information in terms of the application, and that could be within a week or two. Okay, thanks, Ross. Um, Patrick Terranari in Uganda. Um, really same, same question. Um, how uh, quickly can we obtain an interim um, interdict uh, or an injunction in, 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 um, in Uganda? Uh, the courts would be the high court. As much as there is uh, an industrial court established, its uh, jurisdiction and mat the matters that it can handle are quite limited. So the court will be the high court. 
And uh, it will take to get in an interim relief will take about uh, three days and at most uh, five days. Thank you. And uh, maybe just a follow up there, uh, Patrick, are, are, are they pretty, with the proper facts, good facts, are they pretty easily enforceable in, in, in Uganda? Uh, do the courts grant the orders with relative ease if you've got a, a, a good merits as we lawyers would say? Yes, the immediate, what you would say an interim order would easily be obtained when the facts are straight up and then, uh, and that would be before a registrar and then the temporary, what you'd call a temporary injunction or relief would be before a high court judge where it gets a little bit more technical, you have to prove more, but they are easily obtained. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Charles Fisser in Namibia. Yeah, Brian, um, similar to South Africa, uh, you can approach the High Court or the Labor Court, depending on the, the contractual background of, of the matter. Uh, restraints are easily enforced uh, uh, through Namibian courts. And if brought on an urgent basis, you can get your relief within a day or two's time, similar to that of South Africa. Um, Unlike South Africa, we don't have a semi-urgent court role. So you either approach court on an urgent basis or you approach court on a norm, in the normal course of the proceedings. But as I said, easily enforceable, uh, um, no problem at all. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Siobhan uh, in the Mauritius. In Mauritius, uh, like in, in Namibia, there's no concept of semi-urgent. So when you are trying to enforce on an urgent basis, you would go before the judge in chambers. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, given the high threshold in Mauritius, it's moderately difficult uh, to obtain uh, an order on, the, on an urgent basis in Mauritius. You would expect to obtain it if you were to obtain it within a day or two. Um. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, Jimmy in, in Kenya. Um, in, so in Kenya, the position is uh, similar to Uganda. It's uh, possible to get an interim order within a quick timeline, three, three days to a week. Um, and in terms of the difficulty, uh, at, that prima facie, at, at that level, you need to prove uh, certain issues. So it may be a bit more difficult um, unless you can have the facts to prove why you should get it. So the key issue is, the interest being protected. Um, thank you. And uh, Patricia, uh, what's the position in Ghana? So you would institute um, an action in the high courts, um, the commercial division of the high courts or the general jurisdiction of the high courts. You only go to the labor courts um, if similar to the South African position it involves or it stems from a, a labor um, or an employment contract. So it's a commercial court or the general jurisdiction. Um, unlike the other jurisdictions, it's, it's, it's not as easy to obtain um, uh, an order for interim injunctions. The courts are, are, are slower to grant such um, applications. Um, you can file it on an urgent basis, but the courts are, are slow to grant um, orders of interim injunction when it comes to employment matters. Okay, well, well thank you very much. Eustache, um, Rwanda. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, in Rwanda, it will depend on whether the restraint of trade is uh, uh, enshrined in an employment uh, uh, contract. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to protect our viewers here. We have the best possible case. It's in the employment contract. It is uh, a strong case. Uh, how easily enforced is it? Uh, how quick um, uh, can we um, seek an interim uh, injunction in Rwanda? Uh, it's, uh, it will be, it's, it's somehow difficult because you need to prove facts and that to show the seriousness now you've the got all the you've got all the facts the facts are there yeah. we mm. mustn't be our viewers what we don't want to be lawyers here we we've got the mm. best you've got the best possible restraint case has ever been given to you um the merits are there the facts are there you presented 
Um, you, it, it's a compelling case. How quick can you get an order for our clients and, and, um, and uh, um, how easy would it be? Yeah, within six, six days uh, from the date the application was registered, so you can get it easily within six days before the okay. intermediate court. And, and you say, I'm going to know, I'm going to give you shortly an opportunity to deal with those ifs and buts because I can hear your hesitancy. And I'm sure there's a lot more that you've got to say on this. So we're going to now move um, over to uh, Ross Alcock in South Africa, who has a significant restraint of trade practice. And uh, um, I'm going to ask Ross just to uh, detail some of the considerations that have played out in the South African courts over the years in respect of enforcing restraints and scope duration and when and if they will enforce restraints and just the peculiarities in South Africa. And then for the viewer's benefit, we're gonna go through the various jurisdictions and you must tell uh, us what the differences are. So um, similarities, um, we're not terribly interested in, just the differences. So Ross, um, you have the floor. Yeah, in a South African context, uh, what they would look at first is obviously if there's an, an uh, if there's a valid restraint of trade in place, uh, and if there's a valid restraint of trade in place, they would then look at if there's a breach. Uh, if that's the case, then the onus then shifts to the ex-employee that's left the employee, uh, and that that employee has to prove the unreasonableness of the restraint if they seek to, to escape the restraint. So the first point of call is if there's a valid restraint and, and the, then the owner shifts to the employee who has to prove its unreasonableness. In that regard, um, the key factors that we look at in a restraint and, and the court will look at in a restraint is if in order to enforce a restraint, they would look at whether there are, uh, conf whether there is either confidential information uh, that the per, that, that individual ex-employee was uh, privy to prior to to leaving and joining a competitor, or and or if uh, that employee had client connections. Now the confidential information speaks for itself. If somebody sits on a board of directors uh, or, or sits in a senior management position, they're normally prized with confidential information. That is what we that and the the client if the person's got client connections, which is in circumstances where if somebody was to leave, those clients would move with them. They, they often refer to it, you have clients in your pocket. So whether you go and solicit those people, they move with you in any event. Those two aspects, the client connections and the confidential information is what we could refer to as proprietary interests. If, uh, a, if you have a proprietary interest to, to protect, and generally a court will look to, to enforce restraints of trade. Other aspects that they look to uh, is, as Brian mentioned, the duration. Uh, and sometimes you know, it, it'll say there's a three-year restraint of trade. Uh, in, in our experience, restraints of trade, generally they would look to enforce for a period of 12 months, unless you can show that there's good reason to go for, for a period of sort of 24 months. Often in certain where there are contracts a run for a period of two years, then a restraint they would look at from a duration perspective to enforce a restraint. Sometimes the, the proprietary information that the people are prized with is only valid for six months and uh, a court may look to enforce it only for that six month period. The, the other, obviously territory is something, if uh, it's very restricted to a Gauteng region, for instance, uh, then the court will look and will only look to enforce it within that region. Uh, and the other is obviously the scope. If it's far too wide, uh, a court will obviously look and say, well, you, you're trying to really take this person out of, of work uh, in a sense and, and not to, to protect your proprietary interests, which again, I refer to as the client connections and confidential information. So those are really the, the key aspects of enforcing restraint, what they will look at. If, you're, if you have a restraint that's too wide, um, and there is a severability provision, then in the restraint provisions, then you, when you plead your case, it's imperative that you then plead down your restraint to say, I'm only looking to enforce it 
within this specific area, the duration, if you're trying to, you would have to plead it down to a 12 month period and the territory is on a similar basis. So you would have to plead that up front if you were seeking to, to enforce and invoke your severability provisions if it was deemed to be, or you considered it too wide before you brought the application. Yeah, thanks Ross. Um, let, let me just um, unpack a little more with you if I may. Yeah. One of our viewers, uh, um, sent a question regarding how you strike a balance between the constitutional right to work that a person uh, shouldn't be precluded from earning a living and that what's certainly South African lawyers uh, call pactum sons of should be honored. Um, these are difficult balancing acts. How, um, how, how would you answer that question? Sure. Look, a court is going to it's going to weigh up um, the the right to enforce a, or a person is bound by a contract with the right that you you're taking somebody out of uh, earning a living within a particular area, which you've got to you've got to take into account. We're not re, we're not in a terms of enforcing a restraint, not generally taking uh, the ability of a person away to earn a living. You are taking them out of a context where they would join a direct competitor and where they could cause damage to your business. So we're not taking them out completely out of the equation. Our courts have also considered the issue of the constitutional, whether it, uh, in, whether restraints are, you know, uh, pass constitutional master and they've, and the, and the courts have said, they will not uh, look uh, and, and, and say that a constitutional uh, there's a constitutional argument that will be enforced. Um, no, they will go back to, to the law, which says if you have a proprietary interest to protect, they will look at it and they'll balance that against taking somebody out of uh, joining a competitor and earning a living. So the constitutional arguments have been there, uh, but they haven't been uh, they haven't been enforced in any way. Um, what, what I'm hearing is that really there must be some advantage and ability to white ant the previous employer um, on level playing fields. It's not just a question of sterilizing an employee's ability to work. Is any comments on that? Yeah, it's a, a restraint is there to is, is got to protect some to protect something, and that is. As I said, when you've got proprietary interests worthy of protection, somebody goes off to a competitor and they're prized with confidential information, they can damage your business. If they've got client connections and those clients follow, uh, follow that employee to the new employer, they could cause damage to your business. You're not there to, to take somebody out of earning a living. They can go into any other, uh, any other industry uh, and work, but this is purely aimed at protecting a proprietary interest. If you're trying to just take somebody out of uh, the work environment, uh, a court's going to say that is unreasonable and unenforceable. No, um, just a couple of further questions for you, if you don't mind, Ross. Um, one of our viewers has said, well, you know, what, why is it necessary to have a restraint? Just put in a confidentiality clause, which is standard in contracts of employment. Um, so no restraint would be required because the employee would in any event be contractually required to maintain confidentiality. Your comments on that? Yeah, look, uh, confidentiality and, and often we, we see non-solicitation provisions, very difficult to police. Uh, what the courts have referred to the unpoliceable danger of an employee going to a competitor imparting confidential information to that competitor or you know, obviously clients moving across you can't protect those by way of a confidentiality or non-solicitation provisions so a, a restraint is in order to protect you or protect an employer from those risks the unpoliceable danger we don't know what a person is imparting if they go off to a competitor this takes that risk out of the equation all right, and, and maybe just one final question on this. We've also in South Africa had various cases on the connection between restraints of trade and gardening leave. And I'm um, thinking of the Vodacom Motsu case, which our firm was involved in. Um, it, what, what is the connection? How does one weigh those balances and uh, how relevant is notice periods 
gardening leave provisions and restraints of trade. How does one combine those um, those issues? So normally, I mean, from a perspective of, of evaluating the duration of a, of a restraint, if a person is in a notice period, uh, it might be taken into account that the person is out of, they're not employed for a period of time. Uh, and thereafter they go off to a competitor, it might be taken into account when considering uh, the duration of the restraint or whether it's reasonable or not. So in the notice period, basically the employee would pay the employee in lieu of notice and send them home to, to yeah. basically sterilize. You, and, they're, uh, not, they're, not in, they're not in your competitors employed during that period. Yeah. And similarly, I assume in gardening leave uh, much, much the same. Well, it's effectively if you're not if you're wanting to pay them during uh, during that period and, and to sit at home, and you pay them on the, in the normal course, uh, then in those circumstances that would constitute garden leave, and that you've taken them out of uh, working for your competitor for that period of time. They wouldn't be doing anything; they'd be sitting at home. You'd be protecting your confidential information and the like. So both of those periods are, are factors that need to be taken into account in the duration of them. Okay, yeah. I think that's, um, that's that's very helpful. I think we also has given a very comprehensive exposition of restraint law in in, in South Africa, and uh, I think what uh, the viewers would probably appreciate is just an, a short exposition um, from the panel of how it differs. I'm probably going to go to, to one of the easy ones next because um, Namibia um, and South Africa share a common um, jurisprudence. And uh, Charles, perhaps you can tell us what are the differences, nuanced or, 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 or real, between what Ross has said and what you apply in enforcing restraints in Namibia? How would your advice change for a Namibian client? Uh, absolutely no differences, uh, Brian. Uh, as you correctly said, we share legal history and our legal principles are, are similar, if not identical to that. Uh, which Ross articulated, you know, the old locus, locus classicus of magna alloy is, is the basis on which we, our, or our courts over the last 30, uh, 35 years have developed uh, uh, restraint of trade law. So uh, uh, what Ross articulated is also the position in Namibia. I'm showing my age, Charles, but I was at university when Magna Alloys versus Ellis was decided by the appellate division. So I remember the great excitement of some clarity on restraints of trade in South Africa. And can you believe it? It's hot. <laughs> what about owners? Uh, you know, maybe you can also assist us, Ross uh, um, uh, indicated, well, you've got to prove a valid contract. Uh, but then in the South African context, I'm sure some of the, the panelists with English common law will have a very different um, position. The, the onus is upon the employee in South Africa, despite the constitutional protections, to show the unreasonableness. Is it the same in Namibia, your comments? Yes, uh, also the same in, in our jurisdiction. Exactly the same. Okay. And, and in proving a, a valid restraint, obviously drafting and it in writing is... Is important. I mean, what can you comment on that? Yeah, well, <laughs> it is important to lay the, the contractual basis for for the restraint, either by way of employment contract or a, a commercial contract, and uh, uh, you, that is that is a fundamental basis, and that's on which you will protect your rights and which you will approach the court. If those underpinning foundational uh, aspects are not in place. It becomes a struggle and, and it becomes difficult to, to enforce restraint of trade. So if there's a need and if there's a, a, an intention to, to create a um, restraint of trade or restrictive covenant, it must be properly done, properly recorded in a commercial instrument. Uh, as I said, either the employment contract or the commercial agreement, because that is the only base, uh, basis on which you can uh, adequately convince a court to come to your assistance as and when it becomes necessary. And so, if it's unsigned, Charles, if, if the... Well, well if, if it's unsigned, you sit with the evidentiary burden of convincing the court what precisely the terms and the extent of that uh, restraint of trade conditions are. Uh, and then it becomes tricky. So if there's a need for a restraint of trade with, within the uh, uh, employment realm or in a commercial realm, please 
uh, make sure that it's properly recorded, um, properly executed, so that uh, if we run or you run to court to enforce your rights, so that, uh, that a court can easily consider your, your plight. Now, now, Charles, you're acting for a client in Windhoek and one of his most highly skilled employees uh, ups and goes to Sunny Dubai uh, with his laptop, uh, with all proprietary information, customer lists that Ross referred to, um, um, uh, client contacts, and sits on the beach in Dubai with using that laptop and doing business on behalf of her competitor in Namibia. Now, the restraint is signed in Namibia, um, but the person's clearly doing business um, out of the country, uh, but into Namibia. What? What are the what's the position then, and what are the challenges? Challenge, challenging, uh, problematic. Our courts, our courts have jurisdiction uh, either by way of of uh, jurisdiction over the person or jurisdiction over the course of action. So, if the restraint of trade is was executed in Namibia, and you have you have a document, uh, and you can um, acquire interdictory relief, you you can probably approach a Namibian court. But I am concerned that the execution of this order uh, and relief that you may 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 receive from court uh, may ultimately fall foul of the fact that mm. the enforceability of that um, is going to be difficult because the subject or the, the cause of the restraint uh, or the, 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 the person causing the restraint of trade is actually not within the jurisdiction of the court. So it's it's a problematic it's a problematic problem. What you what you probably can uh, endeavor is to get a restraint of court order here and try and enforce it in Dubai. But that's a subject, Brian, that I'm rather... Uh, is yeah, the reciprocal in enforcement of judgments. But, but probably if the, if, the, if the business of the competitor is in Namibia, could you not get an order against uh, the new employer that's using this information in Namibia um, that's... Um, competing with the, the old employer. Is that not possible? You, you would be able to, to do that. You would be able to do that. Okay, I think that's... Uh, and, and uh, you, you know, our, often clients of, uh, of our firm and uh, our colleagues will know, uh, sometimes people do up and go. We have a, a nomadic employees today, global mobility. If they've got operations in, in other African jurisdictions and are significant, would it make sense maybe to... To, to have a, a, a local restraint in those jurisdictions to deal with it enforceable by the local court? Yeah, I would say so. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. All right. Well, that's uh, that's very helpful, Charles. And, and a, a number of those questions I've just put to you on the fly. So thank you very much for, um, for, for, for your assistance in that regard. We're going to go to Kenya next, and uh, I'm going to ask Jimmy uh Samui, to to comment on what ross and, and charles has said again what are the differences maybe we can start with onus because i think you might have something to say on onus uh, thank, thank you brian and um i thank you ross and charles for that ex exposition so from a kind of perspective um some of the two key things that the court will look at which may be a bit distinct is um the public interest um, and the interests of the parties to the contractual arrangement. And often we've seen cases where the court um, expects the person seeking to enforce the clause to demonstrate why the clause should be enforced against, for example, an employee. And here the court will seek to balance the interests in the, of the employee, for example, to have a job and to make to earn a living um, as opposed to the um, employer's um, business interest. So the threshold would, would be a bit higher um, and the owners would typically be on the person seeking to enforce the restraints to prove um, their interests as against the public interest in that case. Am, am I correct, Jimmy, that that I think is in terms of uh, the English law for my sins, I'm also okay, a lawyer. Um, uh, the, I think in English law, the, 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 the onus is on the um, on the uh, to prove we're in something in Namibia, it's upon the um, the uh, employee to show reasonable. So there's a shift. Do you follow the English law um, onus that the employ that the employer must show it's reasonable? Uh yes. Yeah, so we we typically uh, most of our laws um, come from 
you know, are based on English law. And uh, yeah. there is, and generally the courts are employee friendly. So they will always sort of look to see so the person seeking to enforce them uh, from mm -hmm. that perspective. Yeah. Uh, so that's what would make it a bit more challenging to enforce it from a Kenyan perspective. So that's one of the, the major distinctions. And the balancing yeah. act, is it similar to what Ross and Charles has, has, has said? Um, the, the, the balancing act is, is similar. It will be based on the various factors looked at uh, in terms of enforceability of the provisions. Um, the only extra layer is the public interest that is added on top of that. Sure. Yep. And uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm hearing that you would need to um, have a slightly stronger case in Kenya than in South Africa if you were going to easily in, enforce it. Yes. So the the the, the attitude of the of the court uh, and, and mostly is that um, you know there's the freedom of of um, trade and employment, so it will be the higher threshold of proving that. Um, the interest being protected is not merely to avoid competition, um, but to show there's a critical aspect of the business that would be compromised if the individual was not restrained um, from continuing with the activity um, at hand. Um, so it's not just simply proving the contractual provision is adequate, but proving on top of the interest that would be injured. And then the, and the procedure requirements, in a contract of employment or some other contract, uh, you, you need generally it in writing. Is that is is a similar position there? Yes. So, so usually, for most of these clauses, uh, it definitely um, would be useful to have uh, a provision in writing, um, such that when you move to the high court to enforce it, the courts will look at the exact provisions that the parties have agreed to. Um, it will not rewrite the arrangement. Um, and then once we've we've looked at, for example, one of the factors they look at is the geographical scope of the clause, the period of time, the area within which the clause applies. Um, and then it will look at those circumstances to determine whether or not the clause is reasonable be as between the parties. Once that's checked out, it goes now to the issue of the public interest. Okay, well, thank you very much for that comp comprehensive exposition. Um, Patrick in Uganda, um, Uganda, also English law? Yes, Uganda also follows um, common law. So I'm, I'm, assu I'm assuming then the onus is upon the employer to uh, prove that the restraint is reasonable as a starting point. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. And, and what are the differences you've heard the um, Ross and, and Charles and Jimmy's detailed exposition, what, uh, how, how does it compare to, to the position in Uganda? The position in Uganda is uh, similar to uh, the position in Kenya, that uh, the court will also lean more, uh, will give a greater burden to the uh, employer, uh, to the person who is claiming the restraint uh, it's a David versus Goliath kind of scenario. You have a greater burden to prove. The court will have considerations of uh, public policy, the period of limitation, and uh, uh, the extent of geographical coverage. So it, it, it's quite uh, similar to the Kenyan proposition. Is there anything that you, um, Patrick, can think of that's unique or significantly different that our viewers should take into account if they're enforcing restraints in Uganda? Uh, it's um, nothing critically outstanding, uh, save for that the employer really has a greater burden. Uh, like Jimmy mentioned, you, it must also be provided for uh, in writing. Uh, it should be a clause written either in the contract or you know, whatever uh, uh, policy or something like that, so that it's a basis uh, for proof. Okay, well, thank you very much. Now we're going to move over to Shivram, Derby, and Mauritius. I'm sure that there's slightly different considerations, Shivram and Mauritius. So uh, over to you. Maybe you can educate us and our viewers and on, on this combination of French and common law jurisdiction that you have in Mauritius and how you deal with restraints of trade. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. 
Um, substantively in this area, we feel the French law. Um, I've, I've heard about the reasonable test that applies in, in, in a number of jurisdictions where, where we are based. Um, I, I suspect that uh, when you look at the substance of those uh, clauses, it may not be very different, but when you formulate the test, uh, there are a couple of differences. Obviously, uh, the onus is on the employer as well here in Mauritius, and the reasonable test that applies, uh, uh, for instance, in South Africa, would perhaps be akin to what we call here the protection of the legitimate business interests of the employer. So you would take into account the same factors as Ross and, and Charles have uh, set out, uh, propriety interest, confidential information, uh, trade secrets, and matters like that. There's also uh, 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 an condition here in Mauritius is that of the uh, that the clause, enforcement of the clause should not prevent the employee from earning uh, a living. Uh, and that's quite an important uh, uh, consideration, which is in fact linked to uh, the limitation in time of the uh, uh, restraint in question. Typically, uh, we've seen uh, uh, the courts have in some cases accepted to go up to 24 months, but typically it's a question of nine months to 15 months. Uh, there's, there's connected to the limitation in time uh, a criterion is the limitation, geographical limitation, although you will, you will accept that in Mauritius, uh, 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 it's rare to see clauses that apply only to part of Mauritius. There are certain industries in which it may be relevant. Uh, uh, real estate agents use that, but uh, it's rarely, very rarely the case here in Mauritius. What is interesting uh, in the Mauritian context is that these clauses, uh, because of us being an international financial center, so these employees tend to be employed in Mauritius, but as well as in a number of African jurisdictions. Uh, uh, so the, the insertion in the contract of the geographical limitation can be a challenge, but we, we obviously may find ways uh, in order to make those clauses enforceable in the Mauritian law. Well, um, thank you very much. It seems that um, employers are going to have to get their act together if they really want to enforce in Mauritius and take yes. local advice mm -hmm. on, on local law and be in a, a strong position, evidentiary uh, position, as well as uh, um, not limit the employ employment. So it seems it's a tougher jurisdiction to enforce restraints. Yes, as a matter of fact, we see that a number in a number of those judgments, uh, they, these clauses are not enforced because of lacuna in the in the contractual clause. So it's important to get your clause correctly drafted. Although um, I know I'm involved with one of your colleagues for a large logistics company and um, uh, busy enforcing it, so it's not impossible. But it it is uh, it's it, not it at is, all it's impossible. It, it, yeah. is, it is very much enforceable if you've got the right codes and the evidential uh, uh, material is placed before the court. Excellent. Um, I think the last but certainly not least is Patricia, who will um, comment on the position with Ghana, which I think I'm correct, but Patricia is saying that is a common law uh, jurisdiction. It is, it is common law because our, our Labour Act and our Labour regulations do not have um, I see Patricia has gone uh, silent on us. Seems to be a connectivity uh, problem in, 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 uh, in uh, Ghana. I'm going to come back to you, Patricia, because I'm, I'm sure our viewers want to hear what the distinctions are in Ghana, so we'll just leave that for now. Uh, but what I am going to do is to move on, because to time, um, 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 and I'm going to come back to, to Ross Alcock uh, in South Africa, and I want to look at one other substantive issue, and that is, uh, 
let's assume there isn't a restraint, Ross, and let's assume uh, that there is a contract, there's confidentiality clauses, the normal common law applies. Um, what alternative remedies might there be to achieve um, a similar outcome as a restraint? <laughs> And uh, if you could also just deal as a matter of convenience with the position of Anton Pillars, um, I know that you've recently been involved for a very large company in South Africa. Um, I'm delighted to say successfully in, in, in using these alternative remedies. So maybe you could just give, give our viewers um, an indication of what the options are. And uh, you know that in appropriate circumstances, they can be very, very real because not every employer um, you know, puts in a restraint of trade into the contract of employment. Ross? Sure. Sure, Brian. Um, <clears throat> look, the, the, the first issue is, is obviously if, if an employee has gone across and is, is utilising confidential information that they've prized from the previous employer, there are grounds to, to look from the common law perspective, and that's in terms of unlawful competition. So there is an, a, a, an ability to approach court and say that the the employee and the new employer are acting in an, in an unreasonable manner and to, to seek uh, an interdict on that basis, unlawful competition. They're utilizing their, they're utilizing the ex-employer's confidential information to springboard their business in an unfair manner. And that, so that would give you grounds to, to proceed on a, in terms of unlawful competition. The uh, other- Just to- Sorry, Ross, just to sort of position that, my understanding is that that is in our parlance uh, a delict or an English uh, a tort, uh, that it's a civil wrong. Is that is that the basis yes. of the right of it's, action? Yeah, so, well, it's uh, basically, it's a, it's a, the, you have a common law obligation not to, 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 uh, to, to act uh, in an unfair manner, or unfair competition. Uh, and, and so whether there's anything in contract or otherwise, you can approach court yeah. uh, on that basis. Uh, the second aspect that you, and, and potential uh, course of action that you refer to is what we call an Anton Pillar order or a search and seizure order. Uh, and these are quite unique in that they are brought on what we call an ex parte basis. So it's an application which you approach uh, a, a judge in chambers, you do not advise the other side or the ex-employee uh, of the application. It, and it's normally where you've got proof that the, the ex-employee has forwarded confidential information or confidential documentation to their private email address shortly before they left. Uh, and then uh, you go to court with the proof that they forward this information. You approach uh, the judge in chambers and you, you get an order which allows you to go to the various premise where the, the individual um, works, uh, including all, all their home premises. Uh, and what you do there is you get an independent attorney, you get an independent IT expert and the sheriff of the court and you arrive without the individual knowing about the, the court order that's been granted. Uh, and the sheriff, the IT expert, and the independent attorney, which is not, uh, you know, they, they, they're not affiliated to you in any way. Uh, if you're the lawyer bringing the application and the order, uh, they enforce the order. And the last one we've done was at seven different premises. So we had seven different sheriffs, seven different IT experts, and seven different independent attorneys all arriving at the same time where they go in and they uh, obtain the computers, uh, any documentation or the like that might be there, which might belong to our client. And then they go through it systematically to ascertain whether uh, there's any confidential information on those. They then store that uh, and they delete it from the, from, the, from the relevant computers. And that is then dealt with on a return date where uh, the, the individuals who uh, had their computers taken can come and show um, that the, the information was theirs and it wasn't our confidential information and the like. So it is quite a convoluted process. It's quite an intrusive process. And when you're approaching a judge in chambers, you're really going to need uh, to show that 
uh, this information was forwarded, uh, acute detail relating to what was forwarded and the like. All right. I mean, uh, clearly in and um, you'd need to proceed, I suppose, well, circumspectly and uh, have a really strong factual basis before a judge is going to give you an ex parte order of that sort of nature. Yeah, and uh, what we do in, in, in the application, because it involves, you have to give the judge sufficient information to, to make it and, and deal with the confidential information that was taken, is that we deal with that in a separate confidential affidavit, which is only made known to the court. Uh, and then for the return date, only made known to the respondents uh, if they give specific undertakings that it wouldn't be divulged or disseminated. All right. Ross, if you can also just um, um, deal with, I mean, I, I assume beyond Anton Pillars and applications based on delict or tort and for, for uh, unlawful, unfair competition, I assume you can proceed also by way of action for damages. And um, it, uh, does that follow on? Um, is that something that occasionally happens or in your experience? Yeah, look, um, proving damages arising from a breach of a restraint is, is you obviously you're entitled to, but you've got to prove your damages. And that is, of, and that is sometimes very difficult to do. Um, obviously, in, in, a, in a matter where we've brought an Anton Pillar, it's a lot easier if you can show that specific contracts, for instance, have been lost due to the breach of, the, of, the, uh, of their obligations. Um, so it comes down to whether you can prove your damages, and that's to show that you've lost a particular contract because uh, information, for instance, in the Anton Pillar was taken, uh, and they utilized that to under, undercut uh, the ex-employers' um, quotes, etc. So they lost that contract. You can prove that that was a three million rand contract just on that one, uh, and you can then proceed on, and which we will be doing just. Well, that's just one of the claims uh, are based on on the damages. But generally, in restraints, it's a uh, it, it's often difficult to prove the the damages arising from that. So uh, maybe just to follow on from that, one of our viewers has asked this question on damages. Um, in South Africa, how do you about quantifying damages if an employer is aware that an ex-employee steals uh, proprietary interest confidential information IP and uses the same? at a competitor. Must you have a penalty clause on the contract to employment for breach of the restraint? If so, what would be reasonable? Do you put a value of the salary for each month in the restraint? Please provide guidance generally on the issue of damages. Yeah, look, you, you penalty clauses are, are, you could put a penalty clause, but you've got to you got to comply with the provisions of the Conventional Penalties Act. So mm. we, we generally would prefer to go down the damages route. Alternatively, you, you, if a person's been paid for their restraint of trade and they breach that restraint of trade, then you can claw back what you've paid in respect of that restraint of trade. And that's maybe an easier way of doing it if they've been paid. But generally, we, we don't want to curtail ourselves in terms of penalties. We'd rather go down the damages route if you obviously you can prove the damages. It's, as I say, it's a difficult one in improving whether you know a contract was lost directly related to the breach of the restraint. Difficult to prove. Right. Well, um, I mean, if damages are, you proceed and deal it, um, I presume you have to meet the, 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 the normal requirements. And in my experience, Ross, the, the issue there has, has often been um, causation uh, and, uh, and, and actually quantifying the damages. Um, so I think to our viewers ask that, yes, it's difficult. Um, often these cases are won and lost on the interim injunction or interdict. And, and one qu final question for you on this uh, from a viewer. Can Ross also clarify if the law is employer or employee friendly? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Brian. So whether the law is employer. Well, <laughs> let me say that I, I think it's... Enforcing restraints is a lot easier in a South African context from an employer perspective, because you've got to prove the, that there's a valid contract and approve a breach. And then the onus on whether it's unreasonable or not, then rests with the employee. So my view is that it's 
more employer friendly. And uh, the labor courts where we, we, we now bring most of our applications are very much enforcing restraint of trades. Right. And uh, maybe just ask you to comment on a situation I find myself in a client of mine uh, paid a, a significant amount running into many millions to an employee for restraint and uh, upon sending the letter of demand, the lawyer on the other side said, well, the restraint is unfair, it's unconstitutional, it's unenforceable. Um, we wrote back on behalf of the client and said, well, we disagree, but since you've repudiated the contract and not going to comply with the restraint, can you please, by return of check, send us a, a three million rand on the basis that you've been unjustly enriched? Any comment on, on, on that? Well, I think that's right. Uh, you know, if, you, if a person is paid for restraint of trade uh, and you they don't get to squirm out of it, then they, they must repay the monies. And we actually did sue and um, settled the matter. So, so thanks very much, Ross. I think that's useful. I see lots of questions are coming in. Charles, um, you've heard Ross on Anton Pillars. You've heard what Ross has to say about uh, um, the, the, the delictual remedy of, uh, of um, unlawful, unfair competition. And um, perhaps you'd like to comment on that and maybe uh, um, um, uh, whether you've been involved in any 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 similar actions uh brian uh, that's precisely also the position in namibia as as ross uh, uh, conveyed it um and those remedies and, and those process, processes are also the processes that we that we utilize and advise clients to to use in in, in similar situations in namibia so i've got nothing to add i i agree with All ross right, and, and, and Charles, if, if you pay three, three million um, rand in South Africa for restraint and the employee says it's unenforceable, would it be similarly recoverable in Namibia? Your advice was spot on, Brian, also in a Namibian context. Well, I would have advised exactly the same. Excellent. So uh, we're now going to go to some of the other jurisdictions. Um, Patrick in Uganda. Yes, Patrick. Yes. Do you have Anton Pillar orders in Uganda? Can you sue for unlawful, unfair um, 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 competition? Um, uh, yes. Arising out? Yes, uh, there is uh, Anton Pillar injunctions. Uh, they have rarely been awarded or even uh, instituted, but uh, the remedy is available. You can sue for unfair competition, but what we have seen, uh, depending on the nature of the case, more recently, even in a case we are involved in are uh, issues concerning um, a trade secret, breach of trade secrets, um, at times where it involves more IP matters, copyright breach. Uh, so those other remedies can also be sought um, uh, uh, through the courts of law. Right. Uh, one of our um, our um, viewers wants the moderator to give the Rwandan and Ghana guys a chance to speak. So uh, uh, over um, to uh, you, Stash, in Rwanda. Thank you, Brian. Uh, in Rwanda, we do not have the Anton Pillar uh, order in Rwanda provided under Rwandan law, uh, but uh, Based on the fact that the owners under the Code of Civil Procedure in Rwanda, the owners so the, to prove the, uh, the burden, the burden of proof lies with the, the plaintiff or the applicant. In this case, the person who would be enforcing the restraint of trade and obviously would be the employer. And uh, the employer would have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the action by the, the, the employee has uh, caused them damage, uh, and uh, then they can base on that to 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 file to file a case. So the onus will be on the employer, uh, and uh, we haven't had any case in Rwanda where the judge has ordered or an order has been obtained to uh, compel the, the 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 defendant to provide or to seize the evidence element of evidence under Rwandan law. But based on the principle of the onus of uh, the, the, the proof 
the burden of proof, which lies with the employer. Uh, it will be up to the employer to prove the, the breach or the restraint of trade. And uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 the alternative remedy, uh, contractual remedies are provided, but you'll also have to file a civil damage, uh, a case before a civil court. Uh, we have uh, the Access to Information Act, which protects the proprietary information trade secrets, and the disclosure of that information is uh, criminalized. So the employer can uh, base on that and then uh, file a civil case if the criminal court has decided or has uh, ruled that there have been uh, that offense. The employer can uh, file a civil case before a civil court and claim damages. Now, as uh, Ross said, uh, like in South Africa, of course, you have to prove, to prove the damage, the extent of damage that you have suffered. And in this case, still the owners will come to uh, the, 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 the applicant in this case. So it's not a straightforward uh, process, but it's feasible in Rwanda. I just want to clarify, if I may, did you say beyond reasonable doubt or balance of probability? Balance of probability. Balance of okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's fantastic. I think that's um, very clear exposition you stated. Uh, Patricia in Ghana, what, what's the position there on, on lawful unfair competition and Anton Pillow orders? Okay. So, so under Ghanaian law, um, a person can obtain an Anton Pillow order. Um, the courts have the power to grant such um, orders of recovery of evidence. Um, however, they are rarely applied for. Um, I believe Patrick mentioned that they, they are, that's the same in Uganda, same in Ghana, rarely applied for, rarely granted, um, because you must be able to show or prove that it's imperative or it's, it's um, in the interest of justice to grant such an order. And so the, the courts rarely um, grant such orders. There are other discovery tools that um, a person seeking to to uh, recover evidence can um, use, and so those ones um, are more often used. But for Anton Pilla, they are not um, often used. Um, when it comes to competition, we don't have a competition law or act per se. Um, we have a law called the Protection Against Unfair Competition, which is very broad and very vague. Um, broad enough to, to uh, should I use the word, catch anybody that, um, or if, if an, an ex-employee um, is seeking to breach a restraints of trade clause um, by, uh, for instance, taking away customers that belong to their former employee, um, the employer can come under that act and seek some um, remedies. And so and that's a position under Ghanaian law. Yeah, Patricia, can you come under a general tort right of action in the common law? Does that exist for unfair competition? So yes, um, more on economic torts, but what we see often is um, um, in contracts, more in contracts. We don't see the the, the tort aspects um, often. Okay. Thank you. And um, last but not least, uh, uh, because I'm at the end, because I'm sure it has differences. Uh, Chevron and Mauritius. Um, yes, Brian. Uh, are available in Mauritius. Uh, it's something uh, which is in Mauritius as well, derived from uh, our common law uh, uh, laws. So the, the substantive conditions are, are not different to what I've heard. Uh, in the employment context, uh, I haven't seen them used uh, at all here in Mauritius, but conceptually, uh, I do not find any difficulty if obviously the criteria are met for these uh, type of injunctions to be used in the context of an unfair competition claim. Uh, uh, as opposed to uh, a breach, of, a pure breach of a restraint of trade. Uh, bearing in mind that in an unfair competition claim in Mauritius, which would be a tort uh, here as well, uh, the, the principal criterion that you would need to uh, show to, to, to a court is that 
uh, the action that has taken place, uh, which may be wide, uh, there are no prescribed uh, actions or, or an existing list of actions, but ultimately those actions were not normal competition, but they were aimed at causing harm to, to the business of the plaintiff. So in that context, uh, uh, should you satisfy the potential burden, you may apply uh, perhaps uh, for uh, an Anton Pillar uh, uh, saying that evidence is likely to be destroyed by the defendant should you not uh, obtain same on time. Uh, yes, possible. Uh, breach of contract uh, seeking damages, it is possible as well. Uh, although uh, uh, we do not see many of them, it is mostly enforced uh, uh, through the judging chambers uh, uh, by way of injunction. And, and Shivan, if you do gain an end on pillow, is it similar to what Ross uh, said in South Africa, where you get an independent attorney to execute it, or how, how, how do you give effect to it? You would normally... Uh, uh, be accompanied, the attorney who has obtained same would be accompanied uh, by an usher, uh, whether it's private usher or a usher uh, uh, assigned to a court. So this person will accompany the, the, uh, the solicitor, the attorney who has obtained same and will be drawing up a report of what he has seen, where he has been, whom he has met and then that will be made part of the court record. Uh, obviously, if you need to uh, uh, go through uh, a IT system or a server, uh, you would need to be accompanied by an IT expert as well. Uh, but you, I would not be using an independent attorney in this emotion context, but rather a, a registered Dasha. Thank you. All right, well, it's... Um just three minutes past four. So uh, thank you to, firstly to my colleagues for sticking to times. Uh, we are now going to go to the Q&A part of the webinar and we have uh, roughly 12 minutes. Uh, what I'm going to do here is also a quick fire approach. I'm going to put the questions to the panelists and whichever panelists thinks most appropriate to answer must just answer. Also, I'm going to invite um, our viewers if they do have any questions to please um, let us have them now. I have managed to incorporate quite a few of the questions into the discussions uh, thus far. So um, we have three or four to deal with, but if there's any more, anything really worrying you, uh, please um, uh, type them in and we'll try and answer them in the next 12 minutes. First of all, one of our viewers has the following question. What is the company's recourse where it only finds out after six months that the employer has been working for a competitor without having disclosed this during resignation. Anyone want to uh, answer that? Well, that, that would depend on the length remaining uh, in the restraint. So depending on, 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 on uh, what's the length of a restraint and if, if there is sufficient evidence to show that it will continue for some time. Uh, the most direct uh, approach could be to apply for an interdict against that former employee. Um, that's the first thing. But the second thing that I would advise any client to do is to try and assess uh, uh, what has been the damage caused uh, by this employee. Uh, uh, being working with a competitor for six months. If this assessment leads to a conclusion that a number of clients that this employee used to service would have left uh, 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 without any other reasons, then you could assess uh, whether damages could be a more suitable remedy uh, in these circumstances. Uh, thanks, Siobhan. The, the next question to the panel is uh, one of our viewers says that the company doesn't have restraints in place at the moment, but wants to implement restraints. How would we go about that? Any panelists want to answer that? I suppose this is the old old evergreen, the contracts of employment already in existence. What do we do to bring in restraints when, uh, um, when they're in existence and we don't have them uh, in our contracts? Well, Brian, I'll... I'll answer that. Uh, you know, obviously, Thanks, 
any you, you, you any new employees you can uh, get them to sign contract you know their contracts with restraints of trade in place uh the, the other aspect is is you know, people which we've seen is employers have uh, paid their employees to conclude the restraints of trade um if 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 these people are in critical positions um the other way of doing it is to to see if people are being promoted into specific positions as a a condition upon, upon them taking up that new position, you get them to sign the restraints. Um, there's always been the argument that you could go down the route of saying it, it now becomes a, an operational requirement and I'm less inclined to go down that route. I think it's a, a mm. difficult one to sustain to say yeah. the people have been there already and now it suddenly becomes an operational requirement. And if they don't accept the, you know, the new terms you look to terminate, I, I wouldn't go down that route. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that over time you, you can get people to sign the restraints if um, you know, people have taken a, a view that, well, if you want your, your increase at the end of the year, uh, one of those conditions about getting your increase is to sign a restraint of trade. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not one in favor of that. I think that you, if people are moving into to new positions, you can get them to sign restraints of trade. Um, uh, you know, the people have been operating without those restraints for a period of time. So it's going to be a difficult one to, you know, to, to convince a, a court that there's an operational need and requirement. But, uh, you know, people being paid is another way of doing it. If you if you really believe that this is a key critical person, then you can, uh, you pay them to sign the restraint. Yeah, and I know a number of clients I've dealt with have taken the view that, well, uh, we're going to give you a significant increase and um, that's something you would like and we would like in return for restraint and, so, uh, and uh, it, it has proved successful so it's one of many routes but I would just uh, just to add to what Ross says these are very um, challenging areas that you should take legal advice not only in respect of the law but there's HR consequences and human relationship consequences to all of this so so one must be be very, very, very careful of how one uh, approaches it. Thanks, Ross. Um, I have another question here, which reads as follows. What can one do when you know that an employee is acting in transgression of his restraint by visiting clients whilst under the restraint, especially so when no damage loss can be proven? Are letters of caution the only option? Anyone want to take that? Right, I think that's a basis for discipline, to immediately discipline um, if, 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 if that information comes uh, becomes available. I think the first yeah, the, the problem, Sorry, Charles, the, the problem is it's an ex-employee is acting in oh, transgression of, by visiting yeah, well, clients. Uh, you can't prove a loss. Are letters of caution the only option, or is there something else you could do? No, no I think we're back to the previous remedies discuss, discuss either yes. the interdict or, or damages. Uh, but but letters of caution and reprimand and demand is, is not going to help you much. It, it may it may uh, stop the the perpetrator in, in his in his activities or not. So you need to take stronger measures, and that is probably uh, the interdictory route which we've discussed. And and as I said, damages. Now, Charles, some just... lawyers I know. Sorry, is that Ross? Yeah, Ross. Yeah, yeah. sorry. I just wanted to add. If, if, obviously, if you've got a restraint of trade in place, uh, that then. It, the individual would be breaching the restraint and you could look to enforce the restraint. Um, if there's only a non-solicitation provision in place, uh, you could look to, to try and enforce it on that basis. Um, and again, obviously, if, they, if they're acting in an unlawful manner, then there's unfair competition that you could look at. But that's why you would have a restraint in place to protect yeah. you from those type of dangers. Yeah, maybe I can just ask a follow-up question in this very often as a matter of practice, when a client approaches the attorney and they're seeking relief, the lawyer will write a letter saying you're in breach and request um, a clear unequivocal written undertaking uh, within a certain period of time prior to launching expensive and protracted litigation. Anyone got any comments on that? Is it a good or bad idea? Should you just rush off to court? Any, any thoughts from the panel? Well, I think it's a good idea. Uh, it, it, it's, it's probably the, the start of litigation. You know, that's precisely what you want to put before court to say, listen, certain demands were made. 
uh, they were obviously ignored. Uh, uh, and uh, we have no alternative remedy or, or uh, uh, well, to be before this court uh, and, and seek uh, assistance. So I, I would definitely start off with a letter of demand and a demand, but not pin uh, all hope on it. You know, clients um, sometimes want to avoid legal expenses and, and uh, difficult litigation and, and hope that a letter of demand would, would do the trick. It sometimes does, but uh, in many instances, it doesn't. So it's the start of, of your litigation process. And if there's no compliance, you must follow through with, with your legal remedies, your court remedies. Um, Charles, Charles um, does it also have the advantage that if the employee has a defense, you know, uh, and says, well, I didn't sign this restraint or it's not enforceable for whatever reason, you're likely to have some sort of indication of what you're dealing with before you, you head to court um, and are able to take instructions from your client. But 100%. And, and he, uh, this individual may run to, to, a, to a set of lawyers himself, and that may very well set the, 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 the basis for, for proper discussion and find some sort of commercial uh, solution as well. Uh, which which may uh, avoid ultimate court court proceedings. So yes, I think uh, yes, I agree, Brian. Okay, so so now to the panel. There's one final question. We're nearly out of time. Uh, an interesting question because it also brings into play the issue of payment, which after certainly in South Africa after the tax laws changed uh, and you couldn't get tax fee payments for restraints, so not normally the case anymore. But um, would an employer implementing a restraint of trade need to specify in the agreement who the competitors are? Or can this clause remain broad and cover a geographical area, such as South Africa, for example? And also, would the restraint still be effective or can it be challenged where the employer has not made um, any restraint payment at the time the employee resigns? So there's two components to this. Um, do you need to specify the competitors specifically or can you just deal broadly with it? And um, is it enforceable if you haven't paid for the restraint? Any of the panelists want to take either one or more of those um, of that question? I do not think you need to name the competitors. You, I think you would be well advised, however, to say that you should not be uh, employed with someone engaged in exactly the same line of business as you've been engaged was in our employment. But I think it would be uh, uh, curtailing yourself way too much by specifying who the competitors are. In, in Mauritius, I've seen that certain persons, uh, employers insert that you should not get engaged with someone with X, Y, or, or Z license who operate under these licenses. I think that too is a bit uh, uh, too much of a narrow close. So I, I would not advise uh, uh, to name competitors uh, in that way. All right. And does anyone want to comment on paying for restraint in any of these jurisdictions? Is that the normal course that you pay at, um, at the commencement of employment, a lump sum or upon termination and return for the restraint? Any, is, any practice in that? Uh, there's, there's no such requirement in Mauritius. There has been some debates around that. So far, there's no such requirement. And uh, uh, in most cases, employers don't tend to pay employees in order to abide by the restraints. There may be a tactical advantage, Shivan, in, in, in that, you know, if the employed um, reneges on the restraint, clearly they must pay the money back. But um, it's it's very rarely done now. It used to be the case in South Africa when those payments were tax ended many, many years ago. All right. I think that's um, the final question. It just remains for me to, to thank um, the panelists, uh, my, my partners and the various you know, officers throughout the continent for the um, highly detailed and, uh, and clear exposition on a topic such as restraints of trade, which is a highly a complex one in law. Um, the issue of restraints is something clients very, very um, give proper consideration to at the time of employment. It really should be given consideration at that time. And it's an issue that um, needs to be carefully considered. They, they should never be unfair. 
to the employee. Uh, there should always be a, a very good commercial reason for them if you want to enforce them, and they should, should be fair and reasonable. Uh, and expert advice is required, not only in drafting, but in enforcement. So um, um, thank you very much, panelists, for such a clear exposition. If there are any further questions, um, they can be forwarded to me, and I will ensure that whichever panelist you want to uh, ask the question, um, it, that it, they get to that panelist, and I'm sure the panelists will come back to us. It just remains for me to thank the viewers for um, uh, coming on this webinar this afternoon. I hope you found it interesting. Um, there will be more. Uh, I think the next one's likely to be in South Africa, on T2P, in, um, in, in, in law, not always the transfer of the whole part of business is going to extend to start interesting And we go mostly at the revisions at our office across the second floor today. And thank you very, very much, and, uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.